A commentary I read this week began by saying, Many teachers of Christian proclamations have emphasized that preaching is not about, some, about getting something said so much as it is getting something heard. But here, that is in our passage today, Jesus makes quite clear that for him, preaching is not so much getting something heard as it is getting something done. Today we hear the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. For the first time in about a month and a half, we have a line of scripture that doesn't include Jesus saying something. And as Jesus closes out this sermon, we are left to consider what it means to hear God preach. What does it mean to hear the word of God? What are the implications that a sermon or that a preached word has on our lives? And what is the purpose of having this wisdom, this guiding presence of God given to us? You know, as a pastor, I hope that my sermons call us to action. Because as the commentary says, preaching is not about just hearing something, but is about doing. And as Jesus preaches this sermon to his disciples and to these crowds of people, it may seem like Jesus is trying to just teach them all he can about everything. But we are reminded here at the end that Jesus is inviting those who have heard these words in the Sermon on the Mount to consider what these words actually mean in their lives. And not just about hearing these words, but about doing them. And about living them out in our daily lives. And we hear the importance of these words placed upon these people when Matthew, the writer of this gospel, tells us when Jesus had finished that the crowds were astounded because of his authority. They felt as though he was teaching them from a place of high honor. They felt as if his words had a weight of gravity to them. This was no ordinary rabbi who was teaching them. And how do we know this? Because of these words that Jesus uses to finish this sermon. Look with me for a second at verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. There are implications that we could never even have imagined as Jesus preaches those words. Implications for the basis of our faith. Implications for the very nature of being Christians. And one of the most basic creeds that comes out of scriptures. It is the creedal foundation that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And Matthew sets before us this understanding of the Lordship of Christ and thereby gives us a belief system that we build off of as we seek to live out our lives according to the will of God. For if we declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, the Lord of the kingdom of heaven, then we have to be willing to live with the notion that it functionally transforms our lives. It impacts the way we interact with family, friends, neighbors, strangers. It impacts the way we interact with our community, the way we impact with our government, the way we impact, it impacts the way we interact with our world. All of these things around us are changed because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth. And therefore... We have work to do. Now I want to pause there for a second because I don't want you to hear me incorrectly. I want you to know that we are saved and justified through faith alone. And we as Wesleyans and Christians believe that God's grace saves us. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> we believe that God's grace saves us. So let's, let's pause right there because I don't want to be misconstrued that we have to do work to be saved. I want the, the Board of Ordained Ministry to know that so they don't 
Take this beautiful stole away from me. I like it. I like wearing it. But if Jesus teaches us anything, it is that if we believe that we are saved by grace, if we are going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, then we better act like it. We better act like it. And that is what Jesus is telling us here today. There are very real implications if we are going to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Lord and if we are going to claim that we are saved by grace. We view things differently when we proclaim these things. No longer are we blind followers. No longer are we called to just sit and passively do nothing. But we must actively take charge of our faith. We have to recognize the ways of the kingdom. And we have to live as kingdom dwellers. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the man who builds his house on the rock and the man who builds his house on the sand. You see, the foundation of our faith is the Lordship of Christ. And the foundation of our faith is what we build the rest of our faith upon. And so if we truly build our foundation on this understanding that Christ is Lord, then our faith is firm and cannot be swayed. But as soon as we begin to bring our our own selfishness, our own actions into this foundation of our faith. As soon as we try and set stipulations on what it actually means, we begin to crumble that foundation. And the house of faith that we build is built on top of sand. And can easily be swayed and crumbled. So here we go. I've been talking about it for a while and you probably are wondering... What does it mean that Jesus Christ is our Lord? Well, it means that Jesus takes a place of authority in our lives. There's a reason that the people in this passage listen to Jesus. It means that we believe no one or nothing has authority over him. And that to live that way impacts our daily manner of living. It means we have no allegiances above God. It means we serve no one except our Lord Jesus. The implication is that Jesus is the Lord of the kingdom. And just as we think back to the Middle Ages and the times of kingdoms, each kingdom has a Lord. However, unlike those kingdoms of the Middle Ages, this kingdom has no bounds. This kingdom stretches across the entire world. And this kingdom has one Lord. And nothing and no one can take the place of Jesus as Lord of our kingdom. We are not driven by society. We are not driven by any entity other than Christ our Lord. This is why it is the first and greatest creedal affirmation of our church. When the early church was together, they did not have the Apostles' Creed. They did not have the Nicene Creed. They had one four-word sentence that they proclaimed. And we should consider, as we model our communities, here and now, after this understanding, when we forsake this true understanding, when we try and split our allegiances or justify other entities having even an ounce of authority over our lives, we begin to build our faith upon sand. We become overtaken by systems of pain and injustice and suffering, and we become swayed to all the hurt that that causes in our lives. We begin to justify unjust acts. And we begin to think that it is all right to not follow who God calls us to be. I'm sure you can see how difficult this may seem. Because we often try and paint a rosy picture of faith. But you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying that all this stuff that I've talked about in these past two chapters, these past, I don't know how long you probably preached, 30 minutes or so. This is serious stuff. 
with real life implications, it's going to get you in trouble. Because people are going to look at you, they're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think that you go against society. They're going to try and sway you to think that you don't have to stand up for the poor. They don't have to try and feed the hungry. They don't have to clothe the naked. And you don't have to go creating a society that helps to make sure that all of God's children all across this earth are loved. Mm -hmm. and feel God's grace. Barbara Essex writes that being Christian is a deliberate choice and should shape the way that we serve the world. We serve others because we are grateful of a God who loves us, cares for us, and watches over us. Our first act in being a Christian the first thing that we ever do is profess that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, beginning us on a path of eternal salvation. Are we willing to think about the implications that our lives have when we accept that journey? Are we willing to be guided by who God calls us to be? Are we willing to live our lives after the example of Jesus? We must truly ground our foundation in who Jesus calls us to be. We cannot merely blindly follow a Savior. We cannot just come and think we're doing enough just by sitting in these pews or just by doing the basic acts of our faith. No, we have to live our lives the way that Jesus calls us to live, going out and helping others. As we've looked through this sermon, we've encountered different aspects of our faith. We were called to action through Jesus' Beatitudes. Shown what it truly means to be blessed in the kingdom of God. That we do not need to feel high and mighty, but that we can be meek and humble. That we do not have to have all the wealth and riches of the world, but that we can be poor. That we do not even have to have our entire life figured out, but that God will work with us no matter what. We were called to recognize that sometimes the restrictions that we put on ourselves are not helpful. Sometimes the restrictions we put on others prevent our ability to be in relationship with one another. We have to recognize the relationship we have in God is for our own sanctification. That we build up our personal relationship with God through prayer, through fasting, through giving. That these disciplines are practices not for the world, but for God. That we seek to be in relationship with our neighbors. That invites us to see them. Not to judge or condemn them. But to be with them and to walk alongside them in their journey. In these last two chapters, Jesus is building the foundation for his entire ministry. That a righteous life involves two things. To love God and to love our neighbor. And if we are going to be bold enough to sit here in this church, to sit here in these pews and to call ourselves Christian, to say that Jesus Christ is our Lord, then we have to be guided by those two commandments. We have to be willing to go out into the world and to live those two commandments. To express a relationship with God through prayer, through giving, through fasting, through personal relationships. And that we have to be willing to show that we love God by loving our neighbors. This is what a righteous life looks like. This is what following Jesus looks like. This is what it means to live your life as a Christian. And so as you reflect on, on these past two chapters in Matthew, 
And if you haven't been with us this whole time, if you've missed a week or two, I invite you to, to go back. All of our sermons are online. Just go back and read Matthew 5 through 7 and see all these things that Jesus says. But Jesus closes out this sermon by placing himself in a place of authority. And so what do these words mean to you? How are you going to take these words? What persons, places, loyalties, allegiances have you given more authority than Jesus? How are you becoming aware of those places, those things that you're trying to, to give authority? And how are you seeking to make Christ the ultimate authority figure in your life? And how is Christ calling you to offer love where there might not be love present? Because Christ is saying that he is Lord, and now it is up to us to act like him. And so who are you called to go and to serve? Proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, and live like it. Amen.